Hello. Welcome to the diploma course of Guru Nanak Institute of Technology. I'm Dr. Indrajit Bose, and I shall be your course instructor for this session. In this first year of your diploma, you shall be studying various subjects, and this subject is entitled Communicative English. Now, you have studied English before in your school, so I think you are all well aware about the importance and the need of this subject in the curriculum and also in future career building. Now, let me tell you a few words about this course and its aims before we start talking about today's lecture. In this paper, Communicative English, it is basically a skills based subject which aims to equip students with basic reading and writing proficiency skills. So, you must be able to write well in various things like paragraph writing, essays, letters, and taking notes. Note making as a skill, report writing, and various other writing components are included in your syllabus for the first semester. Now, today's lecture shall be focusing on communication and we shall look at what is the role played by technical data in communication. Communication can use diverse modes. So today we shall be focusing on the role of technical data in conveying meaning and how we can interpret and get meaning from technical documents, data sheets, spreadsheets, graphs, charts, diagrams, and so on. We should also be look looking at certain basic symbols which are used for note making and writing. Now, obviously, there are diverse modalities of communication. When you are representing the prices of different commodities, for example, often in a department store you have the prices or the items, the food items which you get in a restaurant. So if we want to know what the items are, we have to look at the menu or we have to look at the display chart. Often in food courts, we have a display chart, right? So what do we have in the display chart? You have the lists of the items and you have the prices. Because if the people who are in charge are asked about individual prices all the time by each customer, it is not possible for them to keep saying all the time. It will be very laborious, time consuming and nor would it be very convenient for them to remember. It will be difficult for the customers as well. So we have the menu and the display chart as a ready reference. Now, do we have the items arranged just in any order we like in the menu or the display chart? No, that is not the way in which they are arranged. We have different items in the menu, Chinese or Indian, food items, breakfast items, lunch, dinner items, soups, sauces, other side dishes, and so on. Sweet dishes, desserts. In this way, they are categorized according to groups. Again, if you talk about the prices of commodities in the department store, again, there might be different commodities which are in different sections, consumer durables, electronic goods, 
fast food items, packaged items, and so on, clothes, other accessories. So they are all grouped di differently and there are different prices over there. So there is a way of representing it. So once again, this is like a wall display of a chart that is given. Once again, remembering individual prices of goods or commodities would not be convenient over there. So we are using the display chart. So there is a significance behind the use of these charts or graphs. Often, when we come to read, now, once again, in your polytechnic course, you are being given the required skills so that you can function independently when you go in for your job immediately after passing out from this course. So you might be going in for a job which will require you to look at pages of data sheets and to make an abstract from there or to di make an information digest of the information that you find in the data sheet. So how will you do that if you cannot read the data? So there is a question of being able to read and understand and interpret the data. So this is all the question of data analysis and interpretation. So at its very simplest, we have to understand what is the meaning of this data and what it represents. Otherwise, we cannot survey or make general trends or even make abstracts of this information. So you will be like a blind man groping for his way in the fog if you cannot read the data or analytics once you are given technical data or data sheets to interpret or to make sense of. So this is a very valuable skill which you need to acquire. So I shall be acquainting you with the basics of this in today's lecture. Now, let us begin by looking at the significance of signs and symbols. As I have said, communication involves diverse media and modes. So there are various oral channels of communication. I can speak through by talking to someone or I can speak on the phone. You hear different public announcements when you go to the stations or the airports. Then there are people selling things, advertising, giving sales talks, people talking in meetings. These are all oral forms and modes of communication. But there are also lots and lots of written channels, emails, pamphlets, posters, banners, flyers, and so on. Now, many of these written channels are in the form of language, whether it is English or any other language. It can be any language, provided that it is understandable to the people for whom it is intended. For example, if you go to the airports or railway stations, you will find that the announcements are made in three languages, English, Bengali, and Hindi, because those are the languages which are commonly understood by the people living in West Bengal or visiting West Bengal. Most uh, public announcements are also given, display boards are also given in the official language of that state in English and in Hindi. This is a com common practice in various parts of India. But apart from language, there can also be different kinds of signs and symbol. When you are driving along the road, you might find that there is a sign on the road, no U-turn. Okay, it's like an arrow which is going a half circle and there is a cross over there. So there is no U-turn over there. You should be able to understand that. Or the road is closed ahead. There is a danger sign. There's cross over there. Take a diversion. So there can be various kinds of signs and symbols also which may be used for communication. That cross sign is telling us not to take the road ahead. Maybe there is some construction work going on over there or maybe that road is dangerous after the rains. So we should not take it. Uh, again, the symbols 
can very clearly communicate meaning, but they have to be understood once again. Now, if we look at the history of human communication, when prehistoric man first tried to communicate, he drew various pictures on the walls of caves. So if you talk of man living in the Stone Age, Stone Age people drew on the walls of their caves. And by looking at their drawings, we can make out how he viewed the world around him. A world peopled by fairy or fantastic creatures, which made him scared or frightened, or he hunted them down. So we get some idea about what he's trying to say by looking at the pictures. Again, in ancient civilizations, like the Egyptians, for example, they used hieroglyphics or picture writing in order to communicate their ideas. Again, there have been various interpretations of these hieroglyphics, which are often found in the walls of the pyramids inside. Pictures are used and symbols are used as notations for ideas. So it is the idea that one is actually trying to find an equivalent for. And when man succeeded, then of course he got language, which is the final development of this whole long process and stage of gradual expression of one's ideas and thoughts in the form of pictures, signs, and so on. So of course, he evolved, man evolved language, and language is the finest medium of expression that man has used. And it is used to formulate various kinds of meanings, and it, it has got lots of meanings. Words have, you know, overt meanings as well as hidden or covert meanings. And also, in spite of using language which uh, can be understood, human beings have also tended to develop various signals or codes or coding as a system in a way of trying to map meaning. Sometimes people use that as a secret language to communicate with one another. Or people used a symbol, like for example, the ancient Christians who were persecuted during the Roman Empire, they used to meet in secret in the catacombs and they had a symbol. Do you know what that was? That was a fish. A fish was used as a secret symbol or sign for a meeting of the Christians in the catacomb. So like this, there are various codes and symbols which have developed and of course there were specialized coding systems like Morse code which was a special code which was used for distress signals for ships. It is now no longer used for these purposes. We have other kinds of codes. Nowadays we have coding as a subject almost. So various kinds of codes as a kind of signifier of meaning have been developed by human beings in the past. And we keep using different kinds of signs and symbols in order to convey meaning. Now we have to understand certain technical symbols and signs and what is the meaning of these signs and certain graphological notations in order to understand. Let us see. You see, a lot of technical data documentation in the form of maps, tables and diagrams exists all the time because it is easier to represent data in that way. However, we have to understand it. There is our reading, which is essential for communication. So there are both the things which are important. That is, we have to read and make sense of it. And at the same time, we should be able to use this data independently on our own. Okay? So let us see how we can read and interpret the data. 
Now, reading comprehension, of course, involves reading more than just the word. It also means data interpretation. Or in other words, reading the data that we find often in documents like reports, textbooks, manuals, newspapers, and so on. In the newspapers, in the business pages, you will find the pictures of the Celtics going up and down. You will find weather report charts. So don't you understand them? You have to understand them. In textbooks also, you might find various graphs or tables. Uh, if you look at the manual of a product which you have purchased, like a mixer grinder, for example, again, you might find that there is a table of different units which is given over there, certain speeds which you are supposed to use for certain things. So it is all arranged in the form of a table. Or in your washing machine, the manual, you find that there is a table giving you the temperatures and giving you the number of minutes which you should use for washing clothes of different types of materials. A certain temperature and setting for cotton, certain speed for silk, certain speed for synthetic fibers, and so on. So don't you have to read and understand the data which is given in the table or the chart over there? Yes, you do. So what sort of skills are basically involved in understanding this technical data given in the form of tables or charts. Let us see. Basically, first thing that we have to understand is what kind of data is represented? Does this represent uh, something which is showing the unit of temperature? Is it money? Is it currency? Is it population growth? What is the index? So we have to find the basic unit and what is the what sort of data is represented? Is it population growth? Is it uh, population density? What is it? Again, the units of measurement. Is it in thousands? Is it in crores? Is it in percentages? Is the data comparative? So is the population growth of Sri Lanka being compared with that of Singapore? with that of Bangladesh, with that of India, or no, is it only that of India? So each time the data will be different. What are the different categories? And what do the figures ultimately show? For each chart or diagram that you have, you can read and understand the data. And in fact, you can even write a brief summary of that data in words. Or in other words, the interpretation of that data, you should be able to give a summary of that in writing. Now, the question that you will ask me is, I think, that uh, if it is possible to give a summary of this data in words, then why are we not representing this data in words? Why do we represent it in the form of a chart or a bar chart or table? As a matter of fact, this is more problematic. No, it isn't actually problematic. It is what is make, makes it easier represent if we write down that whole data in the form of a paragraph then it will make it more complicated and difficult to understand what we are writing when i'm telling you to write in words is is just the interpretation of that or a summary of that in brief but representing the whole thing in just words would be in fact more troublesome and laborious so this representation in the form of a graph or chart is really a way of saving time and labor. Let us explore more to find out how this is done. Now tables are some of the easiest form of representing data or figures. There in a table, you see, I have a table here on the right hand side. And in this table, I am representing data here. You will notice that the years or the decades are represented in this column. So there are different columns. One, two, three, four columns. The years 
or the decades are represented in the second column. The first column gives us the title of this table. That is the TV viewing habits of rural and urban population. That makes it very clear what the table is about. The second one gives us the decades. So the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010 to 90. So there are five to six decades that are given over here. Then we have the percentages of rural population viewing television in these decades and the per corresponding percentages of urban population viewing television in these decades. Now, so you have understood, I think, that this table represents the table of TV viewing habits of rural versus urban population in India in the years 1970s to the present. Now, the different columns are representing the percentages of rural and urban in these uh, various decades up to the present. And you can ask various questions. What does the data represent? Uh, is the data accurate? Obviously, it must be, because otherwise it would not, would not be represented in the form of a table like this. What does the data show? Are there any problems or anomalies? Let's see the data. In the 1970s, 0% of the rural population was viewing television. Yes, there was very few, very little television in the rural areas in those days. In fact, even in urban areas, there was very little. So in the urban areas, we had 5 to 10% of the people watching television. In the 70s, very few homes had TV. Uh, then in the 1980s, we have 25 to 30% of the rural population watching television. So TV had come in to rural homes and around 40 to 70 percent of the urban population watching television. So the percentage in the urban areas had phenomenally increased in the 80s. In the 1990s, 80 percent of the rural population was watching TV, whereas 100 percent of the urban population was watching TV. So TV had uh, reached all homes in urban areas and in rural areas also it has reached more, more than most of the houses. And uh, in the year 2000s, we had around a balanced figure, 98% in both rural and urban areas. So the, in urban areas, the figure seems to have gone down a little bit. And in the last decade, 2010 to 19, we have around 99% of the rural population watching TV and 97% of the urban population watching television. So it seems that the urban population is busy with something else apart from television all the time. So this is the uh, growth or change uh, index which is presented in the table. So we can really understand that it is really an index of change over the years in the viewing habits of both rural and urban populations, which is given or testified by this table. That's interesting, isn't it? And uh, are there any problems or anomalies? No, there are no problems over here, but there are different trends which we can witness. What are the trends? I think there are two trends which are clearly visible and understandable over here. One is that there is a phenomenal growth in percentages of people watching television, both in rural and urban areas. But in the last decade or two, in the urban areas, there seems to be a slight decline, a very slight decline in the percentages of people watching television. Whereas in the rural areas, it has consistently increased. However, there seem to be still a few homes in rural areas which do not have television. Obviously, people living below the poverty level. So do you need a key, a key is a, a kind of an index to the whole chart? No, we do not need a key as such for this understanding of this chart. And if you summarize, how would you summarize it? If you summarize, you can summarize it by saying that the table shows the significant increase in the growth in the number of people viewing television in both rural and urban areas in the decades following the 1970s to the present. And the growth rate continues at a very high rate in both rural and urban areas, but in urban areas it has shown a slight decline 
in the last decade or two. So this is how we interpret this table. So I hope it is understandable that this is the way we interpret the data in a table. Let us explore further. Okay. Again, <clears throat> we have another kind of uh, table given over here, or rather, it's not a table, it's a chart. Uh, here, this chart presents a kind of a data display or data digest. So here we have a bar chart that is presented. So what are they represented in a bar chart? I think you are familiar with bar charts because you've studied them in your school. So the bar charts represent, the two axes represent two different types of data. For example, in this chart, again, rural and urban population growth, again, there are two colors which are represented. I think a key will be required over here. And you can see a very a small miniature key is given on the top right hand side. There are two colors. One bar chart is in, uh, one of the bars is in green, the other is in blue. So the green one represents rural or the blue one represents urban like this. So the key would be required. Sometimes comparisons of data are also given in the form of a bar chart. Again, we have another bar chart given over here where there's a different kind of data that is comparative in nature. This one represents basically the, the calorific value which are present in various fruits per serving. Apple, almost 90%. Banana, more than 100%. Cantaloupe, less than 40%. Oranges and uh, grapes, 60%. Kiwi, more than 20%, orange, oranges, more than 60%, and pears, nearly 100%. So we have the calorific value of given different fruits. So we can compare them and find out where which one has more, which one has less. So if I write this down, think how clumsy and awkward it would be. This has 90%, that has 80%, this has 60%. So this is much more objective, clearly represented, easy to understand, and it can be grasped fast. That is why it is presented in the form of a bar chart like this. So it saves complicated descriptions or technical descriptions which are too involved. It's convenient, it's time saving, and it gives an effective visual display. So it's very, very convenient and easy to understand. And it is also accurate. And this kind of representation is therefore preferred. Now we shall look at another kind of a chart that is the pie chart. Now, why pie? Because it has got a round shape, like a pie. Now you will find that the pie over here has got different colored segments. What are the colors that we find over here? In this pie chart, for example, we have the color red, we have violet, we have blue, green, yellow, another shade of yellow, and we have orange. So there are different colors and they represent the different kinds of English skills and practice which are given to students. The red one represents vocabulary building, orange one vocabulary practice, the yellow, this lower yellow one represents other skills, uh, the yellow one here represents lesson plans which are made by teachers, the green one represents grammar practice, the blue one tests and games and the violet one, skills of reading and writing. So all the units of language teaching and practice are 
covered over here. <coughs> Now, if we have the colors represented like this, then obviously we would find we would need to have a key unless the word descriptions are given. But you find that in this pie chart, we have the descriptions already given in the segment. So we may do without a key also, but if they are not given, then we would be requiring a key. With a box with all the shades of colors that are given in the pie chart together with the requisite explanations for the different fields. The segments can also be represented instead of colors by different dotted signs or other ways. So basically to understand this pie chart, again, it's easy because the size of the segment basically indicates the proportion or the quantity that it represents. So the largest segment would be around 70%, 60%, smaller ones, 20%, 10%, like this. And it has various advantages apart from this size being proportional and suggesting it. We can also summarize large sets of data in visual form. It is visually simpler than various other types of graphs or charts, and it permits a visual check of the accuracy of the calculation. So I say that uh, grammar teaching occupies around 30%, so you should be able to check out and see whether it is really around 30% in this pie chart or not. So this is the way in which data is presented in the form of pie chart. We can also have data in the form of graphs. Now, each data category can be shown in a frequency distribution. Like, for example, the first one that you see on the right over here is the data that is presented by a farmer. So the farmer is talking about the growth rate of rabbits per month. So we can see that it, it is representing the different months and the numbers of rabbits multiplying. So the growth rate seems to be lowest in January and February, but then it is progressively rising after March and it goes up around May to a great high of around 300 rabbits. So that's a lot. So this shows the relative numbers. Now, numbers and proportions in terms of multiple categories can be represented in the form of these graphs. And large data sets in visual forms can once again be displayed in these data graphs. The advantages are that they enable us to understand key values at a glance and they clarify certain trends somewhat better than tables. Also, they allow us a visual check of calculations. So they are extremely advantageous as far as that is concerned. Now, let us look at a few examples to get this clear. For example, look at this. This is, you're right, this is a bar graph. It represents the weekend activities of a boy called Fernando. So that is using also comparative units of language like more than, less than, as much as. So that is used for different activities of Fernando over the weekend. Now, what does the data represent? Let us see what Fernando is doing over the weekend. The bar graph will show us. He is playing sports. He is spending some time socializing. He is watching TV, reading, dancing, as well as working out. So, how much percentage of his time 
does he spend in these activities? So one axis represents the hours per weekend, and the other represents the different types of activity. So Fernando seems to be playing, playing sports for four hours. Socializing, he spends eight hours. Watching TV, he spends around five hours. He spends only one hour reading, whereas he spends four, four hours dancing. And it must be very jolly. Uh, it's the weekend, don't forget. So he probably has parties to attend. And uh, he spends around two hours working out. Oh, so he's health conscious as well. He doesn't uh, idle over the weekend. So he's, he has a pretty busy schedule, let's see, over the weekend. Now, there's a dialogue given over here. So, can you say whether this is true or not? Fernando likes socializing more than reading. Now, going by the graph, he spends around eight hours socializing and he spends only one hour reading. So, obviously, he prefers socializing to reading. So, it's right. So, what does he more prefer more compared to something else? So, it's socializing compared to reading, playing sports, to dancing. So, Playing sports and dancing, he spends the same time. Socializing and working out, working out is proportionately much less. Watching TV and socializing, uh, watching TV is less than socializing. Reading and playing sports, reading much less, playing sports somewhat more. Working out is less and reading even lesser. So we can write sentences about Fernando's weekend activities using the comparative forms more than less than as much as right so this is the this is the interpretation of Fernando's weekend activities using the bar graph uh, now I would like to look at another one let's see now What do we have here? Right, this is a pie chart. Now, again, we have a pie chart showing the time use of working parents. See, what are working parents spending their time like? They're spending 7.6 hours sleeping. They're spending eight hours working. They, they're spending 1.2 hours caring for family members, 1.1 hours eating and drinking, one hour in household activities, 2.6 hours in leisure and sports, and 2.5 hours in some other activities. So this is the total of 24 hours in a day. Now we have some questions. Now the source is the US Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics. So this, these are American working parents. So who is the chart about? People employed with children, employed people without children, unemployed people with children, none of the above. So obviously it is employed people with children. Which activity do these people spend the least time doing? Well, I think they spend the least time doing is in household activity. And what activity do these people spend the most time doing? Eating and drinking, leisure and sports, working, none of the above. I think it's the most time that they spend is in working. And which statement is true? People spend less time working than eating, drinking, and sleeping combined. No, that's not true. They spend a great deal of time working. People spend more time working than eating, drinking, and sleeping combined. Or people spend as much time working as eating, drinking, and sleeping combined. This is the right option. So if you calculate the number of hours, they spend as much time working as in eating, drinking, and sleeping combined. So they have hard working lives. So they are hard workers. You can have further activities like talk about how much time a day you spend on activities listed on the pie chart. Or what activities do you spend more time on? Or do you spend less time on? So I think it was quite interesting. So we got the use of the pie chart and the way that it shows the time use of working parents. We will look at one more chart.
just a minute. Yes, this is the one. Right. The 30 fastest growing occupations. Now, what is it? This is a table. So how do we understand this table? So look carefully. It says the growth of occupations in the years 2010 to 20. And look very carefully what is given over here. It is in thousands, right? In thousands, yes. And we have the different occupations, home health aides, biomedical engineers, carpenters, physical therapist aides, dental hygienists, health educators, and so on. And uh, for each one, it is telling us what kind of training they need. So for home health aides, they need short-term on-the-job training. Biomedical engineers, of course, need a bachelor degree. Carpenters need a short-term on-the-job training. Physical therapists need no training. Wow. And dental hygienists need an associate degree. And health educators need a bachelor degree. Now, the growth, we find that in home health aides, the number has increased from 1,018 to 1,724,000. And And uh, biomedical engineers also increased from 16,000 to 26,000. Carpenters from 46,000 to 72,000. Physical therapists from 47 to 67,000. Dental hygienists, 182 to 250,000. And health educators from 64 to 87,000. So, again, you'll find the questions are talking about which occupation will show the most growth. Again, I think it is the home health aides. How many physical therapy states will be there in 2020? Again, 67,000 is the answer if you look at the chart. Uh, what percentage of job growth will there be for carpenters? What is not true about dental hygienists? Okay, so which kind of job would you prefer? What kind of job is showing the largest growth? What is showing the least growth? Which one has the most qualifications? Which one has the least qualifications? These are the kinds of questions. So we can understand that these tables are an extremely useful way of enabling us to make comparative studies or analysis of different kinds of data. So doesn't this chart make it easy for us to understand the growth of the different professions? I think it does. So it is extremely useful in this way. To go back to what I was discussing, we have seen that uh, there are different kinds of uh, questions. Yes, there are different questions given for each one of these data analyses for charts, diagrams, tables. All. Now, the exercise in comprehension that you have to do is basically to answer these questions. Now, the way of answering is to read the questions, to find out the answers, and note down in pencil if required, and cross-check carefully and write down the answers after that by consulting the table or chart. Now, from what I have read so far in the three case studies or examples, I think it is clear to you that the questions are also of different types. There are some MCQ type questions asking only for the facts, the figures, the percentages or numbers. What is the number of carpenters? By how much has the number of health workers increased and so on? Again, there are very short answer type questions asking for very short descriptions of data or trends. So which one has increased, or this one has decreased, and so on. Or, it num or the number remains the same, like this. So you answer in one or two sentences. Keep it short, just explain the trend, and answer the question that you are asked. Also, there is a third type of question, 
which is more probing, asking for your suggestions or comments or your inferences. What are inferences? Like what sort of conclusions you come to on the basis of the data that is presented. So why do you think that the number of health aids has increased so phenomenally in the last 10 years? I think one reason for that we can speculate is that more people are working and less and less number of people are there at home to take care of the elderly. So elderly care is a serious issue in present times. So we are increasingly dependent upon health services and health aids in order to take care of the elderly and the infirm. So that can be one reason why the number has so phenomenally increased in recent years. So like this, there will be other reasons. Again, the TV viewing habits in the Indian population, the table that I started out with today. Why do you think that the numbers in the urban areas are slightly going down? Again, there can be various reasons. One reason can be that people are interested in other pursuits, or maybe they watch television less. So interpretive type questions. So you write a few lines, think properly first, and then write what you can understand your reading of the data. So these are the kinds of questions we can have. We can also have symbols and abbreviations. A brief look now at the symbols and abbreviations to round off this lecture. They are time saving. They also lend a professional touch, but they have to be properly understood and remembered. Abbreviations are usually short forms like CF for compared to, CP for compare, or EG for, for example, or VIZ for, for example. They're fairly standardized and common. There may also be country specific ones varying between different countries. So symbols are also used, signs and notations are also used to represent things in short form in writing. So this brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope I've been able to shed light on the reading of charts, diagrams and tables and also the use of symbols in analyzing and interpreting data. So you should be able to answer the questions which are based on these tables, graphs, and charts when you get them. So this brings us to the end of the lecture. Thank you.